Well, one of the things that uh, I, I want to underline for you is, and in psychology, it's really more of an attitude than it is um, anything else, and that's the what what we're referring to here is a scientific attitude. And the the thing to keep in mind is, it's um, curious. I mean, uh, clearly, we we would uh, want to know how things happen and so curious is one of them um, having the question in your mind and you look at something and say how did that work um, exactly why does it do that and uh, I have um, on the website if you haven't watched it already uh, a video about the amazing Randy um, and the uh, he is uh, seen basically debunking um, some so-called psychic powers and and uh, how they are done and it seems as if that if we're not curious uh, if we're not asking how does that work um, and we're putting our trust in the person that's talking about it then we really get fairly blind so curious is one um, another one is just flat out um, skeptical and I think that one is uh, is where the uh, a guy like Randy comes into play is uh, there's got to be some reasonable explanation for why things happen the way they do uh, and there is actually a old uh, episode of the Tonight Show with Johnny Carson where this particular guy Yuri Geller um, is uh, really um, escapes partly because he can't do what he says he's going to do. So curious, skeptical, and then finally the whole idea of humble. Uh, I need to be willing to look at the data and then admit the fact that I might be wrong. And so uh, that always happens. Um, and just like like the, the little cartoon here says where uh, the irresistible force meets the immovable object the facts as they are versus the truth as I see it and most of the time most of the time we are engaged in two different activities we are engaged in the activity of sensation which we will talk about later in the semester and we are also engaged in perception and the facts as they are are part of sensation the facts as I see them or the truth as I see them is part of perception perceptions interpretation sensation is the actual sensing of given data so scientific attitude is quite important in uh, critical thinking and there's a level of humility that we engage in in order to just engage in it at all is that I'm always willing to be disproven that's a fair amount of humility what's fascinating to me is watching some of the uh, uh, different debates so-called scientific debates um, around uh, scientific um, my spelling is awful today uh, but around global warming or climate change and global warming and the assertions that are being made often go way beyond the actual data and so they move from data to belief or um, how I understand it so it's just an example of the kind of debate that sometimes we have and we clothe it in this word scientific when in fact it ends up being more a level of religious belief rather than uh, anything else Now, one of the questions I want to pose to you is when somebody says that they're um, involved or they want to encourage critical thinking, how do you define that? Do you define it as um, a way of thinking that uh, separates opinion from fact? How do you separate and understand what that is? And essentially, there are a few things that I want to just highlight. One is a critical thinking actually looks at and is sensitive to the assumptions that people use or are under. And 
critical thinking demands that these assumptions be made um, in the open, if you will, and and openly uh, discussed and um, admitted to, if you will. And so critical thinking understands that how we go about thinking. Some people would actually say that one way to look at this is that it understands what we refer to as meta thinking. In other words, it's how we think about thinking. And that's what we refer to as metacognition or meta thinking. So assumptions are one thing. Um, some other things is just hidden values. And this is one of those that I think uh, we don't really pay nearly enough attention to. And that is scientists and psychology for that matter, um, there is no such thing as value-free counseling, for example, or value-free research. Someone has a value. Again, are they out in the open for everybody to see? Do we understand the perspective that somebody is coming from? And if not, then that's one of the questions I have. And when you look at research, you have to ask that question is what's the, the value base that this particular person is coming from? Is so much of the information, for example, uh, that is found around corporal punishment, there is a preconceived value held by researchers that then they go about finding evidence for uh, corporal, uh, uh, yeah, corporal punishment. And that's, that's one of these examples that in the research that you will be reading throughout the semester that you have to ask is is there a bias um, for the researcher regarding the subject matter that they're talking about so assumptions hidden values um, the other question is is um, how how do they evaluate the evidence how evaluate evidence and do they do it with um, balance? Is there balance in it? Is there a objectivity about it um, that you can discern in terms of their efforts to make sure that they are looking at the data as it really is rather than as they want it to be? Um, and then finally, really, the conclusions. And, and in a lot of ways, when you're looking you're, later on in the semester, you're going to be reading and looking at um, journal articles. And w one of the questions you have to ask is the, uh, are, is, is, is the uh, conclusion fit with the data that the person uh, is actually talking about? So do data uh, equal the conclusions? And if it doesn't, then you have to ask the question why? And that is all very much a part of the critical thinking that we're going to be examining and hopefully trying to facilitate in you as the semester proceeds. Now, I'm sure that most of you have probably hit a website where um, you can't find what you're after or they provide a support um, uh, page, if you will. And a lot of times they usually have within them the, what we've come to know as FAQs, the Frequently Asked Questions. And there are a few things I want to highlight for you in this part of the particular module we're looking at. And the one, que the one thing to keep in mind is the question of, of do lab experiments actually illustrate real life? And the key to pay attention to here is really the idea that um, it's all about the principles that we're looking for. It's not about the specific behaviors. Um, because the, the, the behaviors themselves can be very uh, specific to particular people and, um, and situations. And that doesn't give us any specificity or clarity about the principle itself. So the, the principle is what's at issue, and that principle then leads to uh, the stuff that helps with everyday life. And that, that's the key here in understanding um, what is important about what psychology does. It's not about the behaviors, it's about the principles, okay? Secondly, 
another question that comes up is what about uh, culture and gender? And, and this is actually captured in this little uh, picture down below of um, uh, a woman within a very different culture. And I can tell you from having been in other cultures that um, gender matters a great deal. And uh, cultural aspects of gender matter a great deal. And so uh, whether we know it or not, our culture shapes how we look at things and how we see things as well as our gender. And later on in your career, uh, if you're a psych major, and uh, I offer my gender psychology class later. Um, it's going to be two years from now. I did it just last spring. It, you will learn just exactly how gender plays a part in how we see things themselves. So culture and gender really do matter. And, and even, again, uh, we're not talking about specific behaviors. Just like I said it, it above, we're talking about uh, uh, underlying processes that are important uh, that uh, we're trying to discern in order to understand the interaction between culture and behavior uh, uh, processes that are so important for us to understand. So uh, that's that one. The last one that I want to highlight for you really is about animals themselves. Um, we study animals. We have a variety of ethical guidelines that, that guide research with animals themselves. And this is probably one of those places where um, uh, we vary in how we understand animals and who they are. Ultimately, humans are the highest level of value, if you will, in the creation. We, we're the only beings on earth that, that reflect the imago Dei, the image of God. Am, animals do not. That does not mean that we, that we play loose and easy with treatment of these animals. So ethical guidelines certainly exist in the treatment of animals. And increasingly, for m most people, um, they understand that animals not only benefit from the research uh, but humans do too in the research that we do. It's the conclusions that we make in terms of continuity and how we see them. But animals are used in, in research, but extremely high levels of ethical uh, behavior is expected even when we're treating and dealing with animals themselves. Um, one last one, which I forgot to mention, is really uh, the whole issue of value-free uh, uh, aspects of what we do and like I said before there is no such thing as value free uh, psychology it's not uh, it, it is embedded with its own set of values and increasingly at least from a, a Christ centered point of view or our viewpoint uh, and psychology has gotten more and more actually antagonistic uh, as it's become more and more humanistic in its approach and so uh, value free it is not um, some in some quarters if you go on and uh, and uh, antagonistic and you go on to uh, grad school you will find that there is a fair amount of antagonism for Christians themselves in these settings because of that um, the irony is is there's not nearly the antagonism for other spiritual traditions if you want to call them that whether that's Islam or, or um, uh, Hinduism or Buddhism or whatever. It seems like in a lot of sectors, when we're talking about psychology, Christians are singled out as um, ones to um, receive a lot of um, uh, difficult exposure, if you want to put it that way. So that's uh, some of the FAQs. Principles, not behaviors are important. Culture and gender are also important, but we're looking at underlying processes that are that are part of that when we work with animals we are still expected really to function within a very high level of ethical guidelines and finally psychology is simply not value free in spite of what you might read or hear in any other sector